Do COVID tests actually take 24 hours to process or are facilities just swamped? I had a COVID test done the other day and they told me the results could take 24 to 48 hours. Does the actual test take 24 hours to process or are the testing facilities, labs just really busy? How long does it actually take from the moment they begin testing the sample to when the lab knows whether or not the sample is negative, positive? I'm specifically curious about nasal swabs. If the actual test in the lab takes 24 hours, why is that? Does something in the test need to be cultivated for that long? Edit. Thank you for all the great in-depth responses and for all of the hard work from our lab techs, professionals. It's very humbling to hear from so many different sides of the process. Smiley face. Depends on your center and what kind of test you are doing. The golden standard right now is PCR test. This has been elaborated a lot here, it may take between 1 to 5 hours depending on multiple reasons. There is rapid test for antigen, which will take about 30 minutes to 1 hour. There is rapid test for antibody, which will take between 30 minutes to 1 hour as well. But rapid test for antigen and antibody has many downsides, not readily available everywhere, false negatives and false positive. What propels vomit out of your stomach? Follow-up question, what makes the body know it has to vomit in the first place? I heard vomiting from motion sickness is due to your brain thinking you have been poisoned since the movement don't match the optical input, but what about food poisoning and stomach flu? How many bits of data can a neuron or synapse hold? What's the per neuron or per synapse data, memory storage capacity of the human brain, on average? I was reading the Wikipedia article on animals by number of neurons https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash list underscore of underscore animals underscore by underscore number underscore of underscore neurons closing parenthesis. It lists humans as having 86 billion neurons and 150 trillion synapses. If you can store one bit per synapse, that's only 150 terabits, or asterisk asterisk 18.75 terabytes asterisk asterisk. That's not a lot. I also was reading about hyperthymesia https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash hyperthymesia closing parenthesis, a condition where people can remember massive amounts of information. Then, there's individuals with developmental disability like Kim Peek https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash Kim underscore peak closing parenthesis who can read a book and remember everything he read. How is this possible? Even with an extremely efficient data compression algorithm, there's a limit to how much you can compress data. How much data is really stored per synapse or per neuron? was obsessing over an orb weaver spider in my front yard for essentially this very reason. That spider had the spot she liked, and to pull it off had to stretch a web from the cable line leading to our house from the telephone pole, to a tree in our front yard, like an eight-foot gap or more, and then six feet down to the ground for another anchor, then spin the actual web. After that web was up, she was a master fly catcher with intense reaction times, pouncing on prey in fractions of a second. End of the night the whole web would be taken down by her and she would hide in the tree. This spider had our front yard mapped out. All this accomplished with a brain that wouldn't even leave a visible mark if you smeared it on a white wall with your fingertip. Like, dot how? Is vacuum something that is conserved or that moves from place to place? Wife and I had a long, weird argument last night about how siphons work. She didn't understand at all, and I only vaguely do, imagine what that argument was like. But at the end of the debate, I was left with a new question. If I fill a cup with water in a tub, turn it upside down, and raise it out of the water, keeping the rim submerged, the water doesn't fall out of the cup. My understanding is, the water is being pulled down by gravity, but can't fall because there's nothing to take its place asterisk edit, wrong asterisk, and it takes a lot of energy to create a vacuum, so the water is simply being held up by the cup asterisk edit, wrong asterisk, and is exerting some kind of negative pressure on the inside of the cup. The cup itself is being pulled down by the water, but it's sturdy and doesn't move, so neither does the water. When I make a hole in the cup, air can be pulled in to take its place in the cup, so the water can fall asterisk edit, wrong asterisk. If I did this experiment in a vacuum, I figure something very similar would happen asterisk edit, this paragraph is 100% wrong, the main thing I learned in the responses below asterisk. The water would be held in the cup until I made a hole, then it would fall into the tub. If anything, the water will fall a little faster, since it doesn't need to do any work to pull air into the cup through the hole. 
but then it seems that the vacuum is coming in to fill the space, which sounds wrong since the vacuum isn't a thing that moves. I'm missing something in all of this, or thinking about it all the wrong way. Vacuum isn't like air, it doesn't rush in through the hole in the cup to take the place of the water, allowing the water to fall. But then why does making a hole in the cup allow the water to fall? Asterisk edit, asterisk asterisk thanks all, I have really learned some things today, but now my intuitions regarding how a siphon works have been destroyed, need to do some studying, asterisk. Asterisk edit too, asterisk asterisk really, though, how does a siphon work then? Why doesn't the water on both sides of the bend fall down, creating a vacuum in between, asterisk. So in the first example the air pressure outside the cup, pushing down on the water is greater than the pressure inside the cup. If you have raised the cup up 3 inches the pressure in the cup is minus 3 of water from atmospheric. If you are working in a perfect vacuum there is no air pressure pushing down on the water outside the cup. So you wouldn't be able to lift the water with the cup because there wouldn't be a pressure difference between inside and outside. It's the action of the air pressure pushing down on the water outside the cup that allows you to create the vacuum inside the cup and lift the water. Why is so much focus placed on a COVID-19 vaccine, rather than an effective treatment? At least in my country, sufficient numbers of people are so likely to refuse any vaccine that I can't see how it would actually be effective. So I wonder if anyone can tell me about the state of treatment research, and whether antivirals are even an option with COVID-19 or whether the focus of treatment has been mainly on fixing the symptoms, not eliminating the virus itself. Thank you in advance. Edit, since I'm getting a lot of messages about how stupid I am, I want to clarify that my question in no way meant to imply that we shouldn't be working on a vaccine. I just haven't heard much about the progress of treatment research, and figured some of the helpful scientists here would be able to provide some insight on what is being done on that front. There's a huge amount of research on treatments as well as vaccines. There are thousands of things being tested, ranging from drugs repurposed from other conditions remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, to traditional approaches convalescent serum, to new drugs to completely experimental approaches. Clinicaltrials.gov https colon slash slash clinicaltrials.gov slash ct2 slash results question mark cond equals covid and term equals treatment plus or plus therapeutic and cnetry equals and state equals and city equals and dist equals closing parenthesis shows over 1500 ongoing treatment trials, including asterisk sofosbuvir, ladipasvir and nitazoxanide asterisk photodynamic therapy asterisk isotretinoin asterisk ivermectin and doxycycine asterisk bemaparin asterisk caramycin and so on and so on. And there are thousands of novel treatments in pre-clinical trial phases. But in general, it's much better to prevent than to treat. Vaccines can eliminate the virus from whole regions, they have much lower risks than most treatments, and they're much better understood in terms of how to get from an unknown pathogen to a functional, effective vaccine, whereas treatments for viruses are hard to make, typically have lots of side effects, are often thousands of time more expensive, and don't get used until the disease has started, so there's more disease risk. 